Welcome to the USMLE Step 2 Success Podcast. I'm Dr. Rajani Kata, author of The Successful Match Book, and in this podcast, I share clinical cases with targeted teaching points. This podcast is not affiliated in any way with the National Board of Medical Examiners, and cases and teaching points are not meant to serve as an official study guide or medical guidance. I've been a faculty member for over 20 years, and I've advised hundreds of residency applicants. I know how important standardized test scores are in the application process, although I always remind my students that they're just one piece of the application puzzle. If you'd like to learn more on how to succeed in the residency match, you can sign up for a free 100-page excerpt of The Successful Match book on our website, thesuccessfulmatch.com. It's a regular Tuesday afternoon, and as you get ready to see your next patient, your nurse tells you that it's a longtime patient of yours, Dr. Porter. You are very familiar with Dr. Porter. She's a 50-year-old professor at the local university, and she's in great health. In fact, she's not even on any medications. Her chief complaint is feeling tired and weak. As you go in to see Dr. Porter, you start to really delve deeper into that chief complaint to find out what she means when she says she's feeling tired and weak. And what she tells you is that over the previous three months, she's just found it harder to walk upstairs. Sometimes she feels so tired that she even has a hard time getting up out of her chair. As you perform the physical exam, you document good distal muscle strength. She's able to make a fist really well. However, you do note a decreased strength in her proximal muscles. On physical exam, you also notice some redness of her eyelids and you notice some bumps on her knuckles. When you ask her about these, she said, oh, I think that's just because I've been washing my hands so much. What is the most likely diagnosis here? Are you considering, because of this decrease in proximal muscle strength, polymyositis? Could it be inclusion body myositis? Could it be dermatomyositis? And the next question we're going to ask is what would be the best initial test? Well, in this case, the most likely diagnosis is dermatomyositis. In general, there have been four criteria related to making that diagnosis of dermatomyositis, and four of them are related to the muscles. So, can you document progressive proximal symmetric muscle weakness, an increase in muscle enzymes, an abnormal electromyography, an abnormal muscle biopsy, and then the fifth criteria is compatible skin disease. In this case, we're falling onto the diagnosis of dermatomyositis because she is exhibiting some characteristic skin findings. When you talk about the skin findings in dermatomyositis, there are two that are considered almost pathognomonic. One is a heliotrope rash, and two are Gotrin's papules. And we're going to talk about that more in a moment. Let's consider the two other um, inflammatory myopathies. So dermatomyositis is considered an idiopathic inflammatory myopathy that has characteristic skin findings. If you think about polymyositis, one of the key distinguishing features is that polymyositis lacks the skin findings seen in dermatomyositis, which is right there in the name, dermatomyositis. So skin findings plus muscle inflammation. What about inclusion body myositis? That's another type of inflammatory myopathy. Well, one of the key physical exam findings there is that inclusion body myositis also involves the distal muscles. So, um, you know, on a board exam, they might tell you that the patient is unable to make a fist, meaning that they're having weakness in their hand flexor muscles. So that would be another distinguishing feature. This patient also is a really characteristic patient by history in the 
um, in the sense that she is 50 years old and she's a woman. So there's two peaks of onset for dermatomyositis. One is about that age range of 50 years old, and the other is childhood. And it's two types as common, two times as common in women. So you wouldn't necessarily be talking out loud um, to the patient, but you might say to the patient, well, you know, I'm concerned about a condition called dermatomyositis, and we're going to have to do some further testing. And Dr. Porter looks at you with alarm in her face. She goes, oh my gosh, myositis? Does that mean you're going to have to test my muscles? One of my friends had to have an EMG done, and she said it was so painful when they had to stick those needles into her muscles. Um, or are you going to have to do an MRI? I am claustrophobic. I can't stand the thought of an MRI. Um, I hope you can just do blood tests. Well, let's talk about what the best initial test. Would it be an EMG or would it be an MRI or would it be a test such as an LDH and an AST or a CK aldolase? or would it be an anti jo one So out of all of those possibilities, what would you think would be the best initial test? Well, the best initial test would be a CK aldolase. So when you're testing, your first step here is to document that there's increase in muscle enzymes. There are four different muscle enzymes that you could test. You could test a creatine kinase, which is a CK, or an aldolase, or an LDH, or an AST. Those are all muscle enzymes. The most sensitive and specific of those is a creatine kinase. You could also use an aldolase. So I imagine that the option would be a CK slash aldolase. We wouldn't recommend an LDH and an AST as the best initial test, of course, because they're not very specific. What about an ANA or an anti jo one antibody? Well, an ANA is commonly abnormal in dermatomyositis, but it's not very specific. The same would go with an ESR, a C-reactive protein, or a rheumatoid factor. They might be abnormal in dermatomyositis, but they're not specific for it. Now, an anti jo one has the opposite problem. It is specific, um, for dermatomyositis, but it's not very sensitive. A lot of patients with dermatomyositis are going to have a negative anti jo one One board question I could picture asking, however, is you have a patient with dermatomyositis with a positive anti jo one What is the most likely systemic finding? Well, an anti jo one is also known as an antihistidyl transfer RNA synthetase. And when it is present, it signals an association with interstitial lung disease. So of those test options that I offered, the best initial test would be to go ahead and document that increase in muscle enzymes, and you would do that with a creatine kinase and an aldolase. What about the other options? Well, an EMG electromyography might demonstrate findings, but it's not specific for dermatomyositis, and it would not be your best initial test. The same would go for your muscle MRI. So that brings us to our next question, what would be the most accurate test for dermatomyositis? Well, here your most accurate test would be a muscle biopsy. On muscle biopsy, you have characteristic histology. Again, your EMG and your MRI might show abnormalities, should show abnormalities, but there's overlap with other causes of inflammatory myositis, such as polymyositis. So that's why the most accurate test would be your muscle biopsy. Let's talk a little bit about your skin findings because of the five criteria for dermatomyositis, the fifth is compatible skin disease. Well, the two that you really need to think about are Gotrans papules and a heliotrope rash. And those two are considered almost pathognomonic for dermatomyositis. Gotrans papules, and here on the board exam, I could picture them showing you a photograph. 
Gotrin's papules are overlying the knuckles. They're flat-topped red papules. And a papule, in dermatologic terms, is a raised area that's less than a centimeter. So a patient would typically describe those to you as bumps. And these bumps may be scaly or they may not be scaly, but they are typically going to be either red or violaceous. And a key feature on the photograph that you're looking for is that they're overlying the metacarpophalangeal joints and or the distal interphalangeal joints and or the proximal interphalangeal joints. So basically the knuckles um, or the MCP or PIP or DCP joints. So you're looking for those papules. Another photograph that they might show you that would be far more that would be more characteristic of lupus, um, and this is one of the ways to think about it, is that dermatomyositis is going to be on your knuckles. Lupus is going to be on the dorsal fingers in between your knuckles. Um, so if you have these papules that are over those joints, I want you to think about dermatomyositis. A heliotrope rash is classically violaceous. Or, or erythema, or some overlap, violaceous erythema, on your eyelids. So that's your heliotrope rash. There are also other skin findings that may be seen in dermatomyositis, but they're not as specific. You might have something known as the shawl sign, which is erythema, or it could be hyperpigmentation and hypopigmentation and redness. Um, in the shawl area, which would be sort of your neck, your shoulders, your upper back, you may also have a photodistributed rash. So you might have redness in the V of your neck. You might have redness of your mid face or a scaly scalp, or you could have redness at the nail folds. So lots of potential skin findings in dermatomyositis, but the two that are considered almost pathic mnemonic, again, Gotrans papules and heliotrope rash. Let's now talk about initial treatment because Dr. Porter is looking at you right now and she's thinking, oh my gosh, if I have dermatomyositis, how serious is this? Are you going to be able to fix this? Am I going to get my muscle strength back? So would your initial treatment be IV immunoglobulin? Would it be methotrexate? Would it be high dose systemic steroids? Or would it be a biologic? Well, the best initial therapy is going to be systemic steroids, a medication that's been around a long time. We have a long history of use for it, and we know it works very well in dermatomyositis. It doesn't work overnight. You might need several months for the patient's muscle strength to come back, but it's very effective. So high dose systemic steroids is your best initial therapy. After that, you are going to use steroid sparing immunosuppressant medications. So after that burst of systemic steroids, you're going to slowly incorporate immunosuppressants such as methotrexate, azathioprine, or mycophenolate mofetil. Now, IV immunoglobulin is definitely a treatment that's used in dermatomyositis, but it's not going to be your best initial treatment. It's best used in cases of refractory dermatomyositis. The other board question here is the one that your patient's going to ask you next. Doctor, what else do I need to be worried about here? If you're telling me that treatment is going to help my muscle strength back, are there any other tests that we need to do? I mean, why do I have this condition? Well, I can see them asking you several questions related to this, but the other aspect of treatment here that's most important, apart from treating the inflammatory myositis, is that you have to think about cancer screening. This is an idiopathic condition, but approximately 25% of patients have cancer at the time of diagnosis or will develop cancer, and that risk is increased over the first three to five years. And of the cancers, one to really consider would be ovarian cancer. But really, it could be any cancer, such as lung cancer or colon cancer. So for Dr. Porter, you're going to tell her, you know, one of the things that we know, and I don't want you to be alarmed here, but 
there is an increased risk that you might have or develop cancer within the next five years. So one of the things we really need to do, apart from just starting these systemic steroids right away once we get a diagnosis, is we need to check for cancer. So we're going to really make sure you're up to date on all of your age-related or recommended cancer screening for your age. So we're gonna make sure that you have a mammogram, a colon cancer test, um, but in addition, nowadays, there is a little bit of controversy, but nowadays some sources are recommending blind imaging. So your patient might actually be recommended to go a CT of the chest, abdomen, pelvis. And oftentimes you will recommend a transvaginal ultrasound and a CA-125 to test for ovarian cancer or as a screen for ovarian cancer. So um, apart from just starting treatment, you are going to think about your cancer screening. Another um, question that I might see being asked would be a patient with the characteristic skin findings of dermatomyositis, but who does not have any proximal muscle weakness. Is this a patient that you still need to um, is this a patient that you still need to test for dermatomyositis? And the answer is yes. So muscle disease may be the first sign or it may occur at the same type, same time as a skin disease, or it may actually be that the skin disease comes first and the muscle disease comes later by weeks or even years. Um, I suspect, though, on the board exam, they're going to stick with the classic findings where the two are um, happening at the same time. But your muscle disease might not be present at the time of your skin disease diagnosis. And in fact, it may be um, asymptomatic, even though you might have your muscle enzymes elevated, they might not have developed those symptoms yet. So as you're looking at Dr. Porter, who's feeling incredibly anxious, um, what you tell her is that we are going to go step by step here. Um, I am concerned about dermatomyositis because you have been finding it hard to walk upstairs and get out of your chair. And that signals to me that you might have proximal muscle weakness. And in fact, when I'm testing you here, that's what I'm seeing. And you also have um, what to me looks like a heliotrope rash and Gotrans papules. And those muscle findings together with those skin findings makes me think of a condition called dermatomyositis, where you have inflammation in your skin and inflammation in your muscles. In order to test for that inflammation in those muscles, I'm going to order a blood test. We're going to order a creatine kinase and an aldolase. If those are elevated, then it shows me that you probably have some inflammation in your muscles. And we might then even consider doing a muscle biopsy to confirm the diagnosis of dermatomyositis. If you have dermatomyositis, then we're going to make sure we treat your inflammation in your muscles by giving you high dose systemic steroids. We might later need to use other immunosuppressive medications or even IV immunoglobulin if you're not responding to treatment. But the point is that there's lots of good treatments available. The other thing we really need to do right away is make sure you don't have any underlying cancers because we know that about 25% of patients with dermatomyositis have or will develop cancer. And that increased risk is seen in the first three to five years. So we're gonna to continue to monitor you for these first three to five years. I also need to ask you more questions and do a more extensive history and physical exam because we know that some patients with dermatomyositis have involvement of other organ systems. So sometimes patients might have lung involvement or esophageal involvement or joint involvement. So I'm going to start with that history and physical exam. So that was the recap. And 
we are going to start right now because even though you have a good idea of what's going on here based on history and physical, there's a lot that needs to be done to follow up a patient with dermatomyositis.